Okay, I just turned on the recording. Uh, prior to doing this, we had talked about the uh, the concrete making video that we had watched last time, and uh, how the person who made the video they actually went to the mountains and they dug out the materials out of the mountain rather than going to Home Depot and buying it there. They actually got it from the mountain the way that the, the Romans did. So what I'd like to do now is I'd like to talk about how how the concrete was tested. But first, I want to talk about what are the properties that we're interested in? Because when when you make a material, if, you, if you're a materials engineer and the customer comes to you and says, hey, I need you to make a new material for me. Before you can talk about, before you can even start brainstorming how you're going to make the material, you need to first understand what are the requirements, what are the properties that a material might possibly have. So let's open up a whiteboard here. And let's think about all of the different properties that a material might possibly have. And I'm going to, I'm going to divide them up into categories. So I'm going to, I'm going to have one category, which I'm going to call structural properties. Okay, and then I'm going to have another property that I'm going to call electrical, or another category. I'm going to call electrical. Boy, I can't spell electrical very well. Oh boy, and I can't erase. When I go to tell it I want to erase, it doesn't always see it. Okay, electrical. And uh, maybe it's going to have optical. And maybe it's going to have other, other types of things. Let's just call it that. OK, so structural properties. Those are the ones that let's, let's start with those, because those are the ones that we were interested in last time when we were talking about the concrete. OK, so can somebody unmute themselves and tell me what are some properties that they tested for in the video that we saw last time? Some structural properties. Like the strength when they Tried to crush it in the press. Okay, so crush, crush resistance. Okay, that is definitely a, a property that if you're if you're designing a material that you're going to use for making bricks and things, you it's a very very important property that you need to be concerned about is is how much crush resistance that it has. Okay, uh, and so we let's call that compression strength. Okay, so crush resistance is also called compression strength. What are some other properties that we need to worry about? The, the structural properties that we tested for last time. Tension strength. Tension strength. Okay, and can you tell, so just in case somebody wasn't here last semester and so they didn't they didn't study compression and tension like we did last semester. So if you're one of the new students that came in here, they may not know what tension strength is. So Dons, can you go ahead and tell, tell me, what do you mean when you say tension strength? So you just stretch it until it breaks pretty much. Okay, okay, great. So with compression strength, you're squeezing it until the thing crushes. With tension, you're doing the opposite. Rather than squeezing it, you're pulling it apart and you keep on pulling it apart until it just can't, can't hold together anymore. Okay, uh, another property that uh, you may or may not be interested in, I mean, the customer may or not, but it's one we should certainly think about is the weight of the, pro of the thing. So if you are talking about bricks, then you know a heavy brick versus a medium heavy brick doesn't make a whole lot of difference. I mean, yeah, maybe a little bit, but uh, but not too much. But if you're making an airplane, let's suppose that you need some material that you can use to make an airplane. And so it needs to have really good compression strength, needs to have really good tension strength, and it needs to not be too heavy. Because if it's too heavy, then that's not gonna be a good uh, material to use for an airplane. So the weight of the material is definitely a property that we need to worry about. 
Okay, another thing that might uh, not be obvious is hardness. Okay, so the best way to think about hardness is if you take two materials and you, you take the one, and if I tell you what, let me stop sharing just so you can see a little, easy, little more easily here. Okay. Let, let's say that I have a piece of, uh, well, okay, just use your imaginations. Well, okay, no, here, we don't have to use imagination. Okay, so, so here is a piece of plastic. Here is a metal scissors, okay? So if, if I take the plastic and I try to rub it on the metal, is it gonna scratch the metal? No, but if I take the metal and scratch it on the plastic, is it gonna scratch the plastic? Yes, okay? So hardness is what we're talking about here. So if, if I rub these two together and one of, them, one of them comes away with a scratch, then the one that has the scratch is not as hard as the other one is. So clearly metal has more hardness than the plastic does. Um, and so like one of the hardest materials known to man is the diamond. If you try to scratch a diamond, you're not gonna be very successful, but if you use a diamond to scratch something else, you will be very successful. Diamonds have very high hardness. Okay, and so that's a structural property that you might be concerned about. Okay, uh, now what about, what if the customer comes to you and says, okay, I need you to design me a new material that I'm going to be using in an electrical circuit. So then you're gonna say, okay, well, what kind of properties that they might they be interested in? So uh, anybody, can anybody think of a property that they might be interested in if you're gonna be using an electrical circuit? Conductivity. Conductivity, very good. Okay, because maybe what they're going to do is they're going to use this material as an insulator. Okay, hang on a sec. We just got somebody joined us here. So let me let him in. And obviously Mark and Tardy. Okay, so, so maybe the customer comes to you and says, hey, I need you to design a new material that I'm going to use in my electrical circuit. And what I want to use it for is as an insulator so that if I've got something over here that's metal and something over here is metal. I want to make sure that they don't ever touch. Um, and so I want to separate them with some material. And so I'm going to want it to have very low conductivity. On the other hand, maybe what I need is something that's the exact opposite of that. Maybe I need something that has very high conductivity. Uh, now, if you're really into electronics, you'll learn that there are other properties as well that uh, that electrical circuits might need, but let's not spend a lot of time over that. Let's just uh, focus on this. Now, at the same time as conductivity, also I might be interested in some of these structural properties because if, if you make me a material, let, let's say I wanna make a wire that's really highly conductive, okay? But if you, if you give me something that's really soft, then that could be a problem. Um, or if maybe if it's too hard, that could be a problem. Do you guys know the wires come in different stiffnesses? So like for instance, right? So here's a USB cord and now USB cords are very floppy and, and you want them to be floppy. It's important for the USB, you know, you, you know, because if, if it's not floppy, then what could happen is when, when this thing moves around right here where the wire connects onto the plug here, that could easily break off. If, if this is too stiff, it can break off. And in fact, if any of you have worked with these little mo motors here, some of you were in my, my class where we use these motors to make projects, that was a huge problem. These wires were, were, were really stiff. And every time this got bent, it caused forces onto here. And after a while, it just broke off. Okay, so, so in addition to being worried about the conductivity, I'm also gonna be worried about the structural properties. Maybe I want it to be flexible. Maybe I want it to be stiff. For some applications, that might be the case, right? So in that case, I'm gonna to need to worry about both the electrical properties and the structural properties. All right, now, optical properties, okay? 
let's suppose that I am the customer and I come to you and I say, hey, I want you to design me a new type of plastic. Well, if you're the engineer, I'm one of your questions, in addition, in addition to asking me about the structural strength of the plastic and whether you want it to be a conductor or not a conductor, maybe one question that you might have is, do you want it to be transparent or do you want it to be opaque? You know, if I'm gonna use it for a bottle, uh, people are gonna to wanna to be able to look inside and see the, the liquid. So, so in that case, I would want the plastic to be transparent. But if I'm gonna use it for a computer mouse, I don't really need it to be transparent. And, and maybe for some reason, I don't want it to be transparent. Um, so optical properties are certainly properties that we need to worry about. Okay. Um, now in the exercise that I'm in the activity that I'm gonna give you guys today, I'm going to have you design the material that we started talking about last time cookie-based building material is what we're going to be doing today. And so uh, we're going to focus our attention on the structural properties of the cooking cookie-based building material, because in theory, we're going to be using this as like the bricks in, in some building that we're going to make. Uh, and so we're going to ask all sorts of questions about all these things. Uh, we're not really going to be too concerned about the electrical properties. In fact, we're not going to be concerned at all about it. I'm not going to be concerned about the optical properties, but there is one other property that I am going to be concerned about. And that property is that I'm going to want it to be edible. This is not a normal thing that you worry about if you're, if you're making building materials. You don't usually want them to be edible. In fact, in fact, you usually want them to be not edible. Because if you make a building out of edible stuff, then what's gonna happen is the mice and the deer and the birds, they're all gonna come and they're gonna eat your, your building. So being edible is actually a bad property for a normal structural uh, material. But what we're gonna do this time is gonna be different. So I, I am going to require that it be edible. Now that doesn't mean that it has to taste great but it does mean that it does have to be uh, something that you can eat. Okay, so in a minute, I am going to take off my teacher hat and put on my customer hat. I'm going to pretend to be the customer who is coming to you with a request for you to design a new material that meets the customer's needs. We're going to set this up the way that we did previously. We're going to assume that you work for a big company that has lots of engineers, uh, but you don't want to send all of those engineers to meet with the customer, that's, that's overwhelming. You know, the customer is not gonna be comfortable in that situation. So you're just gonna send one or maybe two engineers and you're gonna sit down with the customer. The customer is going to describe to you what the requirements are for the, for the property that the customer wants you to design. You are then going to, you're going to talk with the customer and make sure that you fully understand the requirements. And then you are going to go back to your company and you're going to write up a functional specification. And it's really important that you do the functional specification. One reason why you want to do it is after you've written it up, you're going to then show it, you're going to then send it to the customer, you'll email it to the customer. And you'll say, okay, here's my understanding of what you need. Can you please check it over and make sure that I have correctly captured everything? So, you know, that is a critically important reason why we do functional specifications. Uh, and then the other reason is because remember, you represent a whole team of engineers. And so, so because they can't all meet with the customer, and you're the only one who gets to meet with the customer. So the other engineers, they need to have a document that summarizes all the requirements. So a functional specification is a super important part of the engineering design process. Um, we've talked about the engineering design process many times. And, you know, probably the most important thing that I want you to learn from this class is the engineering design process. So every time we go into a new branch of engineering and I give you a new problem to solve, 
I insist you have to follow the engineering design process. Right? So step one in the engineering design process is meeting with the customer and understanding the customer's needs and then writing up the functional specification. And you do that before you could do any brainstorming, before you do anything else. Um, okay, and also you need to remember that when you're talking with the customer, the customer might accidentally forget, wink, wink, to tell you all of the important stuff that you need to know. And so it's your job as the engineer to ask the questions to pull that information out of the customer if they accidentally, wink, wink, forget to say it. All right, I think we are ready to start. Uh, before I take off my teacher hat and put on my customer hat, uh, do you guys have any questions? Not seeing any, not hearing any. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to be the customer and I am recording this so that if you want, you can go back later and you can watch the recording. So like when you're writing up your functional specification, if you say, hmm, I can't remember everything. And unfortunately I didn't take good notes, which I should have, um, you can go back and you can watch the recording. But I am not going to write up what I'm about to say. Everything that I'm giving to you in the next few minutes, I'm purposely giving it to you verbally rather than in writing. Because if I gave it to you in writing, well, then I would have written the functional specification for you. And that's, that's not the way it works. You have to write the functional specification. OK. All right, I think we are ready now. So OK, take off the teacher hat, put on the customer hat. Okay. Welcome. Thank you for coming and meeting with me. I uh, appreciate you driving all the way across town to come and, uh, and sit down. Uh, so I'm going to tell you now the requirements for this new material that I'd like your company to bid on maybe working on. Uh, now, I'm as usual, you're not the only company that I'm meeting with. I'm also meeting with a bunch of other companies as well. And my intention is that I'm going to have all of these different companies submit their proposals to me. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to have every company make up some prototypes. And then you're going to give me the prototypes. And I'm going to evaluate the, these materials. And whichever material I like the best, that's the one that I'm going to give this contract to. And this contract is a multi-million dollar contract. If you are the winning uh, proposal, or if your proposal is the winning proposal, then I'm going to give you this contract where you're going to make this new material for me. And we're talking millions and millions of dollars worth of business here. So hopefully this is um, this is going to be something that will be good for for both our companies. But I'm talking to other companies too. So if their proposals are better, then I'm going to go with them for my million dollar business rather than you. Okay, so let me describe what I want. I need a building material that has certain types of structural properties. I need it to be a certain kind of a strength and a certain kind of a hardness and a certain kind, I, you know, various, various uh, requirements in terms of the structural properties. But in addition, this building material that I want you to design for me has one property that is very uncommon in building materials. I want this to be edible, which I realize is, you know, uh, normally that would be the exact opposite of what, what you'd want. I mean, normally, you know, you don't want building materials that are edible because then animals are going to come by and eat your building materials. But I have a special application in mind where I do want it to be edible. So that is very important. Now, that doesn't mean that it has to taste great. Um, you know, I, I don't really care when, when I'm evaluating your bid against some other company's bid. Um, I'm not going to taste yours and taste theirs and, and say, oh, yours tastes better. Therefore, I'm going to go with you. No, no. That, although, although being edible is a requirement, it is not at the top of my priority list. It's actually down at the bottom of the priority list. Um, so as long as it's edible, I don't really care if it doesn't taste great, but it does, it does need to taste tolerable. 
I mean, if, if I if I were to take a bite and then and, and spit it out and say, oh, this is horrible. Okay, that would be that would be unacceptable. But as long as it's edible, we're going to call that good. Okay, now other other types of properties. Uh, I, I'm worried about the structural properties. I don't really care about the electrical properties. I don't care whether it's electrically conductive or, or non-conductive. Could not care less about that. Optical properties, you know, whether it's transparent or not transparent, I could not care less about that. So, you know, give me whatever, whatever you want. Actually, you know, wait a minute. Come to think of it, I think I do want it to not be transparent. Because if I build a wall out of it, um, I don't want I don't want my neighbors to walk by and be able to look through the wall while I'm taking a shower or, or while I'm you know doing something. I, I think so. May, I'm going to take back what I said. I am concerned about the optical properties, and it is important to me that it not be transparent. Okay. All right. Now let's get on to the structural properties. Uh, so you of course know that there are different types of forces that a building material might, uh, might have to withstand. The most common ones are compression forces and tension forces. So here are my requirements in those regards. I want it to have very good crush resistance. It doesn't have to be super, I mean, it, obviously if it's gonna be edible, then it's not gonna be as, as crush resistant as a brick made out of concrete or, or something like that. But it, it does need to be have reasonably good crush resistance. Now, as, as far as the tension force goes, it needs to be somewhat good in the tension force, but tension resistance is not as important to me as, as compression resistance is. But it does need to have some. In fact, let me draw you a picture of one of the ways that I intend to test this material that you're going to make for me. So when you make the material, I'm going to have you make it into long, skinny bars. So I'm going to have you make me a bar that's going to be something like this. And the test bars that you make for me, I want them to be about an inch and a half tall and also an inch and a half wide. And then in this direction, I want it to be as long as you can make it. Okay. Um, and now when you make it, you're going to have to bake it in an oven. That is going to be one of the requirements that I'm going to talk about in, in a minute. And so this will be limited by the size of your oven. So limited by the size of your oven. And depending on how you make it, uh, you, you might even not even be able to make it be that long. Um, okay, so, but I want it to be as long as you can make it. And then when we test it, uh, so let me, let me get rid of this here, whoops. So when we test the, uh, the prototype material that you make for me. I'm going to put it on a support over here and a support over here. And then the first thing that I'm going to check to see is can your beam, so I'm, I'm going to call this the beam, okay? Can your beam support its own weight? Okay. All right. 
So uh, I want this distance in here. Let me switch to a different color here. I want this distance here to be as big as possible, but it has to support its own weight. And so if the thing collapses, then just under its own weight, that will be unacceptable to me. Uh, now, um, so wh what I'm wh the way I'm going to the way I'm going to test it is this. So I'm going to start. I'm going to take your beam, and I'm going to start by putting it on two weights that are close together. So this distance here, call this D. I'm going to start with a very very small distance where it might only be one inch. And I trust that you can easily make a material that will not collapse under its own weight by a distance of one inch. Okay, and then, and then once, once that's been done, then I'm going to move these guys farther and further apart. Okay, so I'll take it to two inches and then three inches and then four inches. And I'm gonna keep on going until the thing breaks. Uh, and I'm hoping that you'll have some really good material to where I can get really far away uh, that, to where this distance here becomes like really, really long to where it's the size of your oven. And I'm hoping that it will not collapse under its own weight. So, so, so basically I'm gonna say, so what is the max distance that I can make between my two support materials before the thing finally collapses. So if everybody can make something where I can go really, really far away and it doesn't collapse under its own weight, then I will go to test number two. But it's possible that maybe nobody can do that. It's possible that maybe your company and the other companies that I talked to, that once I get to a certain distance, that it will collapse. And so if that's the case, then, then, then what I'll do is I'll look to see who was able to give me a material where I was able to get the greatest distance before it collapsed. And then that, that's, that, that's the one that'll be the winner for this particular test. Okay. Now, if we get to a, a distance here where, in fact, tell you what, let, let me pick a number here. Let's now I'm kind of I'm kind of making up these requirements on the fly here. Tell you what, I, I am going to change one thing that I said a little bit earlier. I am going to put a maximum distance here. So the maximum distance here is going to be 12 inches. Okay. Because I don't think that if we go any bigger than that, then, then it's practical in your in the ovens that you guys are going to be using here. So so I will, I will keep moving these weights apart, these supports apart until I get to 12 inches. Once I get to 12 inches, I will stop at that point. Now your beam needs to be more than 12 inches because 12 inches is the distance from here to here. So if your beam is 12 inches, then it's, then it's gonna fall in here. So your beam needs to be, well, we need to have at least one inch on this side and one inch on this side. So, so your beam should be, 14 inches if possible. Now, if, if for whatever reason, it's not possible for you to make a beam that's 14 inches, if the biggest beam that you can make is eight inches or six inches or something, hey, I'll take what I can get. But if somebody can make a beam that's 14 inches long, so when I test it, I can make my supports be 12 inches apart, then then that person will win this part of the competition. Now the competition is based on several different things. So, so just if they win this one part of the competition, that doesn't mean they've won the overall competition. It just means that they've won this one part. Okay, so uh, assuming that people are able to make me a beam that can withstand at 12 inches. Okay, so then what I'm gonna do, so here's your beam. And here's my support on the right. Here's my support on the left. And this distance here is 12 inches. Now, next thing I'm gonna do is if the beam can support its own weight, 
Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start adding additional weight. Okay. And so I have a bunch of uh, weights that I'll just, I'll just pile things on there. Um, one thing that I'm thinking of doing is maybe having a cup. I haven't decided for sure how I'm going to do this. So I'm just, you know, this is, there's many ways I could do it. So one way that I could do it is I could take a cup here and then I could put stuff in the cup that has a known weight. So maybe what I'll do is I'll put a bunch of heavy pieces of metal in there. Maybe what I'll do is I'll put a bunch of water in there. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just going to be some additional weight. And so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to see how much additional weight can I put on here before your beam collapses. Now, remember we were talking about tension and compression? All right, when we have weight on here, I trust you guys. Now, you guys are materials engineers, so you know this better than I do. Um, when we have a force here, this part of the beam is wanting to be pulled apart. So it's under tension. Whereas this beam right here is being squeezed together. So here it's going to be under compression. Okay. And uh, so your, your beam is going to need to be reasonably good at withstanding tension forces. Because if it breaks, this is going to be the reason why it breaks. It, it's, I doubt very much that it's going to break because of the compression forces here. The thing that's going to cause it to break is going to be the tension force. So this test that, I, that we're doing here, I'm going to call this the tension test. And so that is the first test that I'm going to submit your prototype material to, is I'm going to submit it to what I call a tension test. And I'm going to see how much weight it can support if you give me a beam that's 12 inches long. Okay. Now, that's not the only test, but uh, let me pause for just a second here. Do any of you have any questions about the tension test? You think you fully understand the, uh, what, what I'm going to be testing for in the tension test? Okay, then I'm going to move on to test number two. Test number two is going to be what I'm going to call the compression test. Now, for the compression test, I want you to make me another type of building material. I want you to make me some discs like this, where the disc is approximately three inches in diameter. It's okay if it's bigger. Um, um, but in fact, let me let me rephrase this here. Okay, so let me say that it needs to be greater than or equal to three inches in diameter. That's that's a better way to do it. Okay, so the diameter of this circle here, D. Okay needs to be greater than or equal to three inches. It's okay if it's bigger, it's not okay if it's smaller. Okay, now the thickness of this thing needs to be approximately one inch. Now it doesn't have to be exactly one inch, but, uh, but it should be approximately one inch. Okay, so you're gonna make me a bunch of testing objects that are at least one inch thick, or I'm sorry, that are approximately one inch thick and that are at least three inches in diameter. And then the way that I'm going to test these is I'm going to put a heavy weight on top and I'm going to test to see if it crushes. So if we look at a side view here, so here's the tabletop where it's sitting. And I'm going to, I'm going to put a, a plate on top of this and then I'm going to push down with some force. Now, because of the plate here, the force is going to be distributed across here. And so what I'm really going to be interested in is the pressure. 
So hopefully you know the pressure is defined as the force divided by the area. And so if you've got a round circle, the area is equal to pi times the diameter. Or, you know, if you prefer pi r, pi, I'm sorry, pi times the diameter squared over two is what I meant to say. So pi r squared. Okay, the area is pi r squared. So if you want to work in diameter, is pi times the diameter over two squared. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the force and I'm going to calculate what is the area of your circle and I'm going to calculate what is the pressure and I'm just going to increase the force and make the force bigger and bigger and bigger and as I slowly increase the force, I'm going to be looking at your little block here and I expect that I'll start to see a few cracks form. And as long as the crack is a small crack, I'm going to say that's okay. Uh, and I'm going to keep increasing the pressure until when I get to the point where I see a crack that goes all the way from the top to the bottom, then I will say failure has occurred at that point. So I'm going to keep increasing the force until I see failure occur, where failure is defined as a crack that goes all the way from the top to the bottom. That, so if the crack only goes halfway, that's not failure. If it goes all the way, that's failure. Okay, and so this is test number two, and this is the compression test. Now, some of you might be thinking that a big cookie, or well, okay, I'm gonna call them cookies because you know they're made out of edible material, right? So some of you are gonna be thinking that a big cookie is better than a small cookie because a big cookie can withstand more force than a small cookie can. But remember, I'm not interested in the force. I'm interested in the pressure. So if you have a big cookie, then yeah, it's gonna require a big force, but the pressure may not be any different than if you'd had a small cookie withstanding a small force. Okay, so I'm not convinced that there's a strong advantage to going with a really big cookie. As long as the cookie is at least three inches in diameter, that's all I care about. If you want to go for a four inch or a five inch or a six inch diameter cookie, hey, you know, that's up to you. Um, but uh, the thing that's important to me is the, is the pressure, not the total force. Uh, and then, okay, the last test that I'm going to perform is the edible test. So what I'm going to do, or actually what I'm going to want you to do, because actually, to be honest, you're the one that's going to be performing these tests, not me. Okay. So after you've, after you've taken your, your cookie bar and your cookie disc, and after you've tested them until, until the destruction, then I want you to take the broken pieces and I want you to eat them. And if you cannot eat them, then... I will not accept that material. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that it has to taste great, uh, but it does have to be edible. Okay, if, and if it's not edible, then, then nothing else matters. Okay. Uh, that's all the requirements that I can think of. Can you think of any questions that you might want to ask to pull out additional information that I might have accidentally, wink, wink, forgot? How many bars and discs do you have to make? Uh, okay. All right. Um, you only need to have one bar. Uh, and you only need to have one disc. Now, it probably would be to your advantage if you make more than one. Uh, because, you know, things are going to go wrong in, in the baking process. Um, so if I were you, I would definitely make more than one. But when it comes time to submit the test results to me, I really only care about one, one bar and one disc. That's all I really care about. Other what questions? materials? Oh, what materials can we use to make the test bars and test discs? Okay, all right, that's really important. Okay, so 
what I want you to do is I want you to take a cookie recipe of your choice. I don't care whether it's a chocolate chip cookie or whether it's a snickerdoodle or whether it's an oatmeal raisin cookie or, you know, I don't care. Now it does have to be a homemade cookie. It cannot be a store-bought cookie. It has to be a homemade cookie. And so I want you to take a cookie recipe and now you don't have to follow the cookie recipe exactly. Uh, like for instance, if it's a chocolate chip cookie, and if you think that the addition of the chocolate chips might uh, degrade the structural performance, you know, if you think that it might be stronger without the chocolate chips than it would with the chocolate chips, I'm okay if you decide to leave out the chocolate chips. Um, but, you know, maybe putting them in is good, I don't know. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, if the cookie recipe calls for a certain amount of butter, um, I'm okay if you vary the amount of butter. Uh, if you think that putting in extra butter might help make it stronger, or if you think that putting in slightly less butter might make it stronger, I'm okay with that. Same thing if the recipe calls for flour, you know. If you want to go with the standard recipe, that's fine. If you think that maybe making it with a little extra flour would help, or maybe making it with a little less flour, or a little more egg, or a little less egg, or whatever, I'm okay with you varying the recipe, but, uh, but I do want you to have your starting point be a cookie recipe. Any other questions? So on that topic, you said it must be a cookie recipe. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead, I can hear you fine. Oh, sorry, it's fair there. Okay, yeah. Okay. So you mentioned it has to be a cookie recipe. Um, like, what is the exact definition of a cookie, like, in your opinion? If I look on the recipe and it says cookies, you know, it says chocolate chip cookie, or it says raisin, raisin, raisin oatmeal cookie, or it says snickerdoodle cookie. Uh, as long as it says, as it says cookie in the original recipe, I, that's good. I call it a cookie. Is that a good enough answer? Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I'm Eliza? assuming it doesn't matter what temperature we bake them at. Ah, okay. All right. Does it, it doesn't matter what temperature we bake them Okay. That's a super important question. I'm glad you answered that because I accidentally, wink, wink, forgot to talk about that. Um, you, can, you know, part of the recipe is the temperature that you cook it at and also the time for which you cook it, okay? So those are things that you are allowed to vary. If you think that cooking it at a higher temperature will help it to make it structurally more, more strong, that is, that is okay for you to cook it at a higher temperature. Same thing with the length of time you cook it. If you wanna cook it for longer than the recipe normally calls for, that is okay, that is allowed. But remember, Okay, after you've tested your, your material and you've got all these crumbles, you know, crumbled pieces of cookies sitting on your plate there, remember it is a requirement that you do have to eat the cookie. So if you have cooked it at such an incredibly high temperature for such an incredibly long time that the thing is hard as a rock and therefore it's unedible, then that's not gonna be acceptable. You have to still eat it. it. Now, it doesn't have to taste good. It's okay. It might be a little crunchier than you would normally like, but as long as you can still eat it, then I call it good. Do you have to eat it by itself? No, you're thinking have a glass of milk with it. Is that what you're thinking? Something like that. Yeah, yeah, you can have a glass of milk with it, but I will not allow you to dunk it in the milk. You know, you know, a lot of people, they like to dip their cookies in milk before they eat them to soften them up. That will not be allowed. You have to eat it without dipping it in milk first. Now, it's okay for you to drink some milk at the same time you're eating it. You just, you're just not allowed to dip the cookie in the milk before you eat it. 
All right. Um, so when we're testing it, does it have to be at a specific temperature? Uh, room temperature. All right. Yeah. So when you pull it out of the oven, you definitely want to let it cool off for a while. You can let it sit at room temperature. Can it be colder than room temperature? No, no, I want it to be room temperature. That's an excellent thought. Because I mean, I can see where you're going. You're thinking if you- I was going to freeze the cookie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's an excellent thought. Um, so no, it has to be at room temperature when you test it. Uh, I have a question. Okay. What if you have access to an industrial freezer and then you're in the freezer while you're doing the test? No, not good enough. Room temperature meaning, you know, like about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Are we allowed to add edible rebar? Ah, okay. I was, I was hoping one of you would say that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so you remember last time we talked about concrete and we talked about the fact that concrete is wonderful under compression and horrible under tension. And so what people do in order to strengthen the concrete is they add metal bars that's called rebar. Okay, so Don's is asking, is it okay for you to add rebar into your cookies? And the answer to that question is yes, as long as the rebar that you add has to be edible, okay? If you put metal bars in there, bzz, nope, not allowed. But if you can find something that performs the function of being rebar and is still edible, then I will allow it. Now, there are some things that I will not allow. You might be thinking of taking a candy cane and putting a candy cane inside the cookie as your edible rebar. I am not going to allow candy canes because you can't chew candy canes. Uh, you, and so, so when I say edible, I'm going, to def, I'm going to redefine edible to mean something that you can eat by chewing it. And so a candy cane is not chewable, therefore it's not allowed in my mind. But if you can find something else that is that has that kind of structural strength, like a, like a, like a, you know, like a candy cane does, or at least similar to it, but also one that you can chew, that will be allowed. Any other questions? Does that have to be baked with the cookie? Yes, it okay. does have to be baked in. So when, if you take this edible rebar and you put it in with the cookie dough, okay, it does have to be baked in the oven along with the rest of the cookie. That is a requirement. Okay, and do we need to record the ingredients we use? You need to write them down, yes. So now in the functional specification, which is the thing that's due for tonight's homework, um, that would not be part of the functional specification. What the, the ingredients, that would be part of the engineering specification, which you will be required to write up, but that's not tonight's homework. Tonight's homework is only the functional specification. Anything else? Can we eat it at a different, like, how long do we have to eat it after testing it? Like, can we eat it after a certain amount of time or does it have to be within the next five minutes of testing? Um, I want it to be within, within the next few minutes after you've tested it. Now, I'm not going to require that you have to eat the entire thing because the entire thing is probably going to be more than, uh, I mean, if you get this big, long, you know, 14 inch cookie, 14 inches long, that's going to be more than you eat in one city. So yeah, you don't have to eat the whole thing, but you do have to pick up a representative sample and you do have to eat a, a portion of the, of the cookie, but you don't have to eat the entire 100% of it. No. So what would you say like 50% or like 30% or like how much of the cookie? Enough to prove to me that it's edible. So, so 
like for instance, if you were to put some edible rebar into your cookie, the piece that you eat, the piece that you eat has to include a piece of the rebar, okay? So just enough to prove to me that it's edible. You don't have to eat the whole thing. You know, I don't care what percentage, as long as, as, long as you include a representative sample of everything, including if you, if you put some edible rebar in there, you need to take a bite of the edible rebar. Okay. All right, uh, one question that nobody has asked is the timeline for this. Um, so let's talk about that. And I want you to put it in as part of your functional specification. Uh, so the functional specification is gonna be due next time we meet, which, is, which would be Wednesday. Um, on Wednesday, we're gonna do some brainstorming and uh, we'll talk through various recipes. So I, when you come on Wednesday, I'd like you to come with a, a recipe or two that you think might be a good recipe. And when we do the brainstorming on Wednesday, we're gonna talk about whether we think a chocolate chip cookie would be better or would an oatmeal raisin cookie be better or would a snickerdoodle be better or you know some other type of cookie. We're gonna, do, we're gonna discuss those as part of the brainstorming. So please come prepared with at least one cookie recipe when, you, when we come here uh, on Wednesday. And also on Wednesday, we're gonna talk about what do we expect if we cook a, uh, if we bake a cookie with more butter or less butter, what do we think is gonna happen in terms of structural strength? Or if we get more flour, less flour, higher temperature, low temperature, those are all things we're gonna talk about on Wednesday. So it's not part of the functional specification that's due on Wednesday but I want you to come prepared to talk about it. So then the question is, when do I want the, the cookies to be actually baked and tested? Do you guys think that if I were to say that I want them baked and tested by Sunday night at midnight, is that a reasonable time frame? So I want you to type in the chat box uh, and you can do it in a private message if you want or a public message, I don't care. So I want you to say either yes or no to the question, do you think it's reasonable that I would want you to have these things baked and tested by this coming Sunday? So I'm only seeing two answers so far. Okay. All right, uh, I, most people are saying yes, but a couple of you are saying that you would prefer a little bit more time. Um, okay, so there's enough people who are saying no that I think what I'll do is I'll give you a little bit more time. Okay, so uh, let me think about that. So it will not repeat, not be due this coming Sunday, but it will be due sometime next week. I just haven't decided for sure when next week it'll be due. But, it, but I will give you more time. Um, oh, one other thing that I should, I should mention to you. Um, some of you might not have access to an oven for various reasons. Um, and so if you are one of the people who does not have access to an oven, then what I want you to do is I want you to send me an email message privately and you and I can talk about other alternatives that we can do. Because I realize that there are people who for, for whatever reason don't have access to an oven and I don't wanna put you at a disadvantage if you're one of those people. So send me an email message and we will come up with some alternate assignment for you if that's the case. Okay, so uh, let me ask you another question that I want you to type in the chat box. Do you think that you understand everything that you need to know so that you could now write up a functional specification? So type yes if you think you could write a functional specification based on what we've talked about. And no if you have more questions. I have one question. Okay, what's uh, that? So we're going to apply pressure to it, but how long do we apply the pressure for? Ah, thank you. 
that was an important thing that I did think about. And, and this is one that I didn't accidentally forget. This is one that I genuinely, honestly forgot. But yeah, that is an important uh, thing. So let me open up the, uh, the whiteboard here. Okay, so when we are doing the tension test, okay, so we got a support here and a support here, and we got a long bar right here. Okay, when you apply a force here, so let's say force one, it needs to hold that for at least, let me, I can't write very well here. So at least 10 seconds, okay? And if it can withstand that force for 10 seconds, then I want you to go to force that's a little bit higher. And I want you to hold that for at least 10 seconds. And if it can withstand it for 10 seconds, then I want you to go to a ne next one that's even higher still. So keep going up in small steps. And each time you increase the force, you need to wait at least 10 seconds before you increase the force again. Thank you for asking that question. That was a really important one, which I did intend to talk about. And I, I honestly forgot that one. Okay, it looks like everybody is confident that you uh, can write up a functional specification based on that. All right, so if you look in Canvas, you'll see that your homework assignment tonight is just the functional specification, nothing else at this point, except when you come to class on Wednesday, please come prepared with a cookie recipe of your choice. I don't care what kind of cookie it is, just a cookie recipe of some type bring that with you because when we meet on Wednesday, we're going to be doing some brainstorming and it will be very helpful if we have a couple of cookie recipes that we can uh, be uh, referring to while we hold the brainstorming session. Okay, well, I am now done with everything that I have. So if you don't have any more questions, you can go ahead and type buy into the chat box and head out. If you do have a question, but you didn't want to ask because you knew the class was being recorded, here I'll stop the recording and then we can talk without it being recorded.